time. Somewhere after 8 p.m., somewhere before midnight, January 1966. Place, the Jade Room, Austin, Texas. The attraction, a band called Rocky and the 13th Floor Elevators. The setting, a dimly lit downtown beer lounge where all the action is on weeknights. So the thing that catches your eye in the dimly lit smoke-filled room is the Gilded Dragon, suspended above the bar and tables. The smoke, reflected from a few well-placed lights, suggests an incense burned to gods that have no knowledge of you or I. But the eye of God is not important here. There's another eye, and this eye gazes into the Oppart Syndrome. Through the scene that changes, though things die, there is a girl. She's wearing funny clothing. Her Oppart dress moves. One can follow the bouncing ball, as it were. Follow the polka dots, spaced just right. Oh, yes, spaced. Just right, etc. The tune is not music, rather a pulsating something that pulsates, a throbbing that continues to throb. She moves, and the stripes and circles move with her, unreal images splattered upon a moving canvas. And now the whole floor is aflame, moving in unreal movements, while dancing girls, oh, so young, pantomime the act before its meaning. Resurrect Van Gogh in sun splotched splashes, yielding to the dance the age demanded. And so, one after another, the pieces fall into place. The age demanded, this needs no introduction. And yet, there is a girl with tight thighs who's forgotten what it's like to touch while dancing until she remembers. And the movement stops. Frozen, like a firefly trapped in amber, there is a sound that goes beyond all motion. It ripples off the walls like silent laughter, settles like the darkness of an ocean. Here, at least for one, the eye emerges, belted by the bass drum's throbbing pedal. We cannot understand what they're doing, but we like it, or drawn to it like a magnet. It makes no sense which is nonsense. Still, it moves. Last call. Lights out. Paper cups, anyone? Party after hours. It's at a friend's place. All people are friends in time of need. Someone said that, and I didn't. And so, where five years ago, Miles Davis would have been drawing sketches in Spain, the Beatles are bombing Bach into Baroque. Two o'clock. All is well. Sort of. Freaky people used to make freaky things happen, but we've learned our lesson. Now everyone talks about how to make lots of money, easy like, without killing somebody. Somehow. They talk about the Rolling Stones are more important than Ernest Hemingway. And I just remembered something very just use his foot or uh, he was uh, uh, that that sort of that sort of no bullshit energy was very very important to the whole situation Stacy and I were playing in Port Aransas and we came up to Austin one weekend and heard Rocky play mm -hmm. and then we, we met Tommy Hall in Port Aransas and he introduced us to Rocky and then we started playing with Rocky. Rocky dropped the band that he had and started playing with us. Yeah. That was the spades he was playing with? Yeah. Okay. Do you know anything about the Lingsman? Yeah, we were the Lingsman in Port Aransas. Well, it got to where the drugs were a problem for the other fellows. And they were always putting pressure on me to get high with them. I just got to where I got tired of being bugged about it. I was going out the back door to go to the gig and I looked, was staring a 45 automatic in the face. And I backed up, there was a 
cop at the back door, and then they he went around, let them in the front door, and they came in and busted me. The reason they got me charged was there were some seeds and stems in the bus that somebody had left in there on the floorboard. So they charged the bus with possession and took it in and confiscated it. There they were in a family situation. Uh, Clementine's two children by a previous marriage, her husband, and a bunch of, you know, perfectly nice, calm, quiet people, except that they uh, had odd hours, came in and out at odd hours of the day and night. Where was this now? Um, this was here in Austin, up on 32nd Street. There they were doing nothing except playing music, uh, getting stoned and behaving themselves uh, when uh, the local cops, uh, principally Bert Gerding and Harvey Gann, decided that they had to have an example made. And so they did. They made an example. They knew that these people were there, and so they came there. And by Jesus, they found themselves a, a square tin of marijuana, uh, five and a half by five and a half by five and a half inches, just your regular T tin, uh, and drug them all down and said, oh, you terrible people. And it all went from there. We had to go to court. Stacy got two years probation. Tommy got two years probation. And Rocky got off because they misprinted the search warrant. They put the wrong address down on the search warrant. Mm. And everybody tried it but me. And they got down on me about that. But they kept me as a drummer because I'm a pretty good drummer. We met Leland Rogers through uh, Gordon Bynum. We signed a contract with Gordon Bynum. And then Bynum sold us to international artists, and that's how we met uh, Leland Rogers. We were informed we'd been sold, mm -hmm. which we didn't want to do. Oh, Mr. Rogers. I, <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Leland is a, well, Los Angeles personified, which was not really appropriate at the time. I mean, you know, the man wore double knit slacks before you could get any. Uh, it was it was great, and uh, he he tried his best to promote these people as an act, and they were an act. They were a, they were a fact. They were a, a, a phenomenon, uh, and he never got that. And so many arguments ensued. Good-hearted man, he was trying. We played about, oh, three months before we went to California in Austin. And we came back to Austin after California and recorded our first album, and then we played in here in Texas. The crowds were bigger after we'd gone to California. The sessions took a long time. They had a lot of technical problems in getting us recorded, getting a good balance and everything. The sessions were very tiring. So by the time we got through with the song, we were exhausted with it. We cut our first album in eight hours. We drove in from California. We arrived at Dallas at 3 o'clock in the morning and went into the studio that were then started recording our first album. They didn't even give us a break. We just, as soon as we got there, they opened the doors and said, come on in. What did you get from international artists? I got, uh, I think at one time, about $350 from them. Mm -hmm. Is that all? That's all.
a deeply sensitive kid and that things hurt cruelly and cut deeply, things that might not have bothered anybody else at all, did him. And he agonized a lot over his inner feelings and turmoil that he felt within himself and just over religion itself. He used to talk to me a lot and I'd find his Bible lying around open and he'd say, what does it mean where it says so and so? He really knew it better than either my other two did at the time. I'd but from that time on, from the time he was 14, he was really a happy little boy, and he loved to fish and hunt and be in the outdoors. And the year he was 14, there was some big change in his life. I never knew what. From that time on, he, he seemed sort of depressed, and uh, maybe he was just thinking his own thoughts. He daydreamed a lot, which is common to adolescents, and I thought that's what was happening to him. He was just growing up, you know, and having a kind of a bad time of it. But there were evidently a lot of things changing in his life at that time. Sort of a sad look in all these pictures from that point on. And not too talkative. He could be. He could be with the people he knew and loved. He could be very talkative. But in most groups, he just sat silent and didn't have too much to say. A lot of the kids at the Jade Room when he was playing there called him the Dark Angel. And there are pictures of him at that time just bathed in perspiration, you know, and so intent on what he was doing that he was just like he was in another world almost. He spent hours and hours practicing. He'd go back to his bedroom and play these records by different guitarists. Chet Atkins, he got his first. And there were, I can't even remember the others, but I just know he'd buy them, bring them home and play until he could, you could be in another room. You couldn't tell the difference. Was one of his uh, favorite songs, uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valens? Oh, yeah. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, his brother came back telling him about this movie he had been to and wanting him to go see it, and it made a big impression on him. He went around singing that for days and days. And I know another of his favorites in high school was Tell Laura I Love Her. He must have played that to me in times. <laughs> Every night I'd threaten to yeah. throw him and it both out. And then he began to play hooky. And he'd go off, and so I got where I wouldn't let him take the car. I'd take him and put him out in front of the school and take the car on with me. And uh, once, well, in his senior year, he'd been he'd missed 18 or 19 days out of that six weeks. And I said, where were you? Down on the river. What were you doing? Playing my guitar. Why didn't you go to school? I let you out at the door. I don't know. I got there and I looked at the door and I just got sick. I couldn't go in. I was physically sick. So he just turned, walk away, and go down on the river and play his guitar. I had one of the teachers say to me, well, I think he was on drugs. Now, whether he was or not, I can't say. I asked him one time later, you know, where did you get drugs? And he said it was the clean-cut college kids that came home from the weekends on, from over Austin that brought it here. It was under a rock up Town Creek. And it wasn't just now. It had been there for years. You couldn't kick over a rock. You couldn't find some. And, of course, Tommy and, and Rocky and the whole group became interested somewhat in Zen and in some of the Eastern religions. Tommy is a very, very articulate and educated person and he was older by five or years at least than the other kids were and he knew about a lot of things that they didn't really know about and I feel like uh, he, d he directed some of their interests for a while now I could be wrong he, um, back when he was in high school he used to go out to a certain teacher's house and I got kind of perturbed over that because here was a, a lady teacher who lived alone and she was probably in her 50s and all the high school boys were going out there. And I thought, why? I had myself had been in her home and she had walls of books on, on religions. And he said, that's all we do, Mother. We go out and talk about religion. You won't believe that, but that's what it is. She knows everything, and this may have been the beginning of some of this Zen and Eastern religion, I don't know. Really, the band, I feel like, in listening to them talk, that it was a religious experience to them. They thought they had found something that was 
a way for people to understand one another and not hate one another anymore, but just love one another a lot. And then he just told me two or three times about experiences he had had. He said once when, when he was in jail that he saw a small light that at first seemed like a pinpoint of light to him. He was lying in a bunk toward his feet and on the wall and that it began to grow and grow and it got bigger and bigger until it filled the whole room, you know, with light. And he said, I've never forgotten how I felt. And I knew that God was with me and that he was watching over me and that nothing really bad was going to happen to me. It reassured me and calmed me. And then another time he was talking about seeing a tree and that it looked like it had a diamond on the tip of every leaf that it was so gorgeous and so beautiful. And he said, you can't tell me things like this come from Satan, that they're, they're heavenly visions and they're sent by God. And I'll defend that with my life, and you can't ever make me believe it's rotten or wrong or bad. And when I used to plead with him, I'd say, well, look at the band and the things that have happened to all of you. And if you were really right, it looks like something good would happen and come of it, you know, and not just all the bad things that have because Rocky had gone to Rusk and Stacy had gone to prison. I think he turned to drinking. When he went over here to the state, when they said there wasn't anything wrong with him, they said, true, he has experimented with drugs, but he is not addicted to any of them. But he does have an alcoholic personality. And if he doesn't get hold of himself, this may be the route he'll take. I don't guess anyone ever re will really know what really happened other than what Bunny knows in her own heart about it. I told you that she called me three times during the time they were married, which was about 15 months. It was always at 3.30 in the morning and told me she was going to kill him. And this would throw me into a panic, of course, and I... And I tried to tell him, you know, what she had told me on the phone, and he kept saying, she, do she doesn't mean it. She's a gentle, sweet girl, and she would never do anything like that. And I'd say, well, why does she call me? Why does she? It was just like a different person. She was afraid of him. And he, he had earlier bought a gun, a 22 gun, and some shells and showed her how to use them. And he bought hollow point shells. And the boy who lived with them, this Tony, said when they came in, she was sitting in the kitchen with a butcher knife. And he tried to talk to both of them because they were both angry. And they had been arguing earlier in the day. And they went out and drank some beer and came back. And he was still angry, and she was too, and they were arguing. And he tried to say something to him, and he said, Stacy said to him, keep out of this. You know it ain't your affair. And he said, I went off into my room then and shut the door. Then I heard the shot, and when I ran in there, she was standing with the gun in her hand. Uh, first thing to say about Stacy, a hell of a guitar player. Another thing to say about him is that he was a haunted man. He, he realized that the devil was after him. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why he concluded that, but he did. And uh, so he would sit there and play the guitar, and uh, the devil was two steps behind him all the way, and he wasn't sure whether that was because he was uh, consorting with the wrong people or because he hadn't prayed that night or, or because he was fooling around with fancy women or what, uh, but he knew the devil was after him. And uh, I miss him a lot. I saw the kind of consciousness it was bringing about and it was paranoia. There wasn't anything I could do to stop him from doing it. I tried to get Stacy to stop, but they just argued with me. I think it's terrible the way he died. And he's a good friend, and I'm sorry I lost him. And a lot of people are sorry. He had a lot of friends. 
and then later on when it just seemed to slip out of their grasp, well, it seemed to me like he sort of lived in the past, you know, that he was going to, you know, I say, well, well, we had it made. It was just right there. What happened? And I'd say, you have to quit thinking about that. I can't forget it. That's all I think about. Were they the first psychedelic band? Oh, yes. I'm, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, there was nobody playing anything like that. Even with the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane? Well, uh, you know, I ran across some of those people, too. And, uh, you know, they were, they were taking dope together, but they weren't making music together on the dope, right. if you see what I mean. Only later, after they were allowed to by Tommy and his bunch. I mean, just consider what courage it takes to stand up on the stage in New Orleans, stoned on mescaline, and do your best. Uh, you know, most people weren't ready to do that. Did the elevators take psychedelia to California? Don't know. Just don't know. I think, in a way, they did. But there's always the dead. You know, you can't get around the dead. Right. <laughs> did psychedelia originate in Kerrville, Texas? No. Flat no. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 